Uh, hi, my name is Sharad Potraju. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Beacon Stack. Uh, thanks, Akshay, for having me over. Uh, excited to talk about my entrepreneurial journey here with all your listeners. So uh, let's start with uh, you getting into IIT. Uh, you know, just like, what was that like for you? Uh, and, you know, how, how were those years formative for you? And then from there, maybe you could tell us the story of eventually becoming an entrepreneur. Sure. Uh, so I, I grew up in Hyderabad, uh, and, uh, and, uh, as with every middle class Indian household, because studying for IIT is, is very aspirational. And I think my parents, uh, my, my mother is actually a professor now retired, but, uh, and if you're in academia, uh, there is a strong sense of you should study for IIT and just do JE, et cetera, et cetera. So I think I have that kind of insurance right, uh, very early on in life, uh, uh, fortunately for me, I also really enjoyed, uh, math, science, etc. So studying for it was a joy. Uh, I learned it was, it, it, it was quite fantastic in terms of, uh, you know, meeting a lot of people who were equally driven, et cetera, et cetera. And I started studying for IIT like most people at the age of 16, uh, I studied, I got through IIT and, uh, and joined IIT Madras uh, in 1998. Uh, I always keep talking about the fact that joining IIT is is pretty spectacular in many ways. Kind of set me up for entrepreneurship because studying for IIT is is what I call is a training for delayed gratification. Right? Yeah, that's you so are, true. Yeah. You're a you're a you're a teenager. You're young. Your hormones are raging. You want to you want to check out girls, you want to check out boys, you want to do all the, uh, lots of, uh, you're discovering yourself, right? And instead of doing all that, you're sitting and studying maths, physics, and chemistry, right? And, and all with the whole purpose that many, many years later, it will be, it will serve you well. And I think uh, it's, it's a pretty, despite the maths, physics, and chemistry, I think the important thing there is learning the fact or kind of subtly or explicitly teaches you the fact that uh, investing in today helps you for something in a much bigger way or you essentially earn back multifold of your investment today because, you know, you waited for it. And that sense of delayed gratification is what really helps you in entrepreneurship too. Otherwise, it's very hard to kind of justify and wake up in the morning and come back after you've had a long, crazy day the previous night. Yeah, yeah, that's amazing. And uh, did you do some entrepreneurial stuff while at IITs, like in terms of, uh, or it was yeah. a regular journey? Yeah, it was a very, very typical journey, uh, to be completely honest. I, I, I don't think I have, uh, nobody in my, I come from a very classic middle class family. My father was a banker. Uh, my mother was a prof. Uh, so there was no sense of business, satanda, uh, anything of that sort, uh, growing up. Uh, I think, I think it's only when I basically can start reading and learning more about it. I realized that, you know, entrepreneurship is a very strong and a fantastic vehicle to kind of create impact, a disproportionate amount of impact. And it, it has the power to kind of influence and touch many people's lives in many ways. And I felt that maybe building a company and being an entrepreneur would be my calling. Of course, when was this that you felt this way? I think I started feeling it in undergrad. Um, at least I know this now because even recently when I met my undergrad classmates, they did remind me that this is what I talked about. So clearly I, I was rambling a lot more than I understood at that time on what it took to be an entrepreneur. Uh, but uh, it is, yeah. So I think I think in undergrad, when I started reading books, et cetera, it really kind of shaped my thought process around yeah, I want to be an entrepreneur. I want to start a build a, build a business. Yeah, what was the path to, like, uh, you know, did you take some baby steps? And I mean, you know, typically there's a journey of, uh, like, becoming a whole hog entrepreneur. You start with some baby steps, experiments. And so, so what was that path like for you? I think I'm still on that path in many ways. So yeah, we, okay. I, I, I'm still discovering and I'm still learning, but 
I always wanted to be an entrepreneur from a standpoint of it sounded very exciting. I thought it's a big challenge. It it the idea of kind of of creating something from a scratch sounded very exciting to me. I think I've always trying to build things from first principles. I'm a person who thinks from very first principles basis. That's always been my strength in many ways. And that's what kind of got me, gave me the excitement and the confidence that maybe I know what it will be to be able to do that. That's one. The second thing I think about uh, entrepreneurship, I mean, personally for me, I, I do think it's always about, about being having the right partner or either having the right co-founder. For me, my, me and my co-founder Ravi and I have been classmates from fifth grade. We've been school, we went to, we to school together, we went to high school together. We went to IIT together. We were also roommates in New York. So we were we were building or we were dreaming or, uh, or, or aspiring to be entrepreneurs much before we actually became one. And as, as, as our parents tell you and as everybody tells you that, you know, you're, you're the sum or the average of the four or five people that you hang out with. Um, for me, I was very fortunate that my co-founder, my co-founder obviously the close friend and even my others, close friends are all entrepreneurs in, entrepreneurs in their own right. So I think that 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 dream just kept kept getting embellished. It just kept getting sharper. I think the clarity just kept more emerging and that's the reason why um, I went to the US, did my master's, was, was an investment banker, but somehow it didn't really tempt me to kind of continue doing that and, you know, get into that golden cuffs where you start making enough money that you feel like you don't want to give this and come back to something and start from afresh. So, so I think that, I think a combination of so having good company and, and just reading more and learning more about it just helped me kind of navigate my path to being an entrepreneur from, from where I started. So you were an investment banker in the US. Uh, what, like, how did that person become an entrepreneur? Like, what was that path? Did you uh, find an idea, quit the job, or did you quit the job first and then search for ideas? Um, I think a little bit of both. I, I think, like I said, it's it, entrepreneurship was always at the back of my mind. But uh, I also learned very quickly that if you want to build some very really strong foundation in, in, in business, et cetera, the best way to do that is to go to consulting or in bank. Um, you join like, you know, Merrill, Merrill Goldman, Morgan, Lehman, well, Lehman was there at that time. <laughs> or you join Bain, BCG, McKinsey in consulting. Right? These are the things that really stood out. It gave you a brand, it gave you the network, it gave you, more importantly, quantitative thinking capabilities, which really were uh, are much needed. And what really happened for me was, so I went, I went from IIT, went to Duke, where I did my master's and I focused on lot on getting into banking and consulting and I had a few offers and I took Merrill Lynch, which was a Merrill Lynch investment banking role, which, which obviously gave me a tremendous amount of learning. I loved every part of working on Wall Street. Uh, but I think the intent there was always do that for a couple of years and then move back to India to start up. Uh, I think what really happened for me there was, uh, I came, um, it also coincided with after after work for four years, it coincided with the the beginning of the financial crisis. So it was a much easier decision in many ways because I realized that either I go back and pursue my dream, or wait here and hope that I don't get laid off, which was happening in March in on on, on in New York. And I think that's that's really kind of gave gave me the impetus and conviction. And that along with obviously the fact that Ravi was my co co-founder, Ravi also was in the US. He was also looking to move back and that's where we collaborated and said, you know, you both have always jumped up this, why not we do it, do this together? And that's how, uh, you know, our, our company came along. Yeah, what did you start, like you and Ravi, and that time so, when you came back to India? So we started a company called Mobstack. It was basically, uh, I mean, it, it was a journey of 10 years where, you know, we built some multiple products and many of them really uh, great products which had spectacular failures. But I think yeah. that our, our original intent was, uh, was, you know, iPhone had just come out. 
the mobile revolution was just unfolding itself in 2009-2010. Uh, we were going around. Uh, and I, I, I think I should take a step back. I should, I should basically also share the side that Ravi and I have been pretty foolishly romantic about building a global product company out of India. We always dreamt of building a global product company out of India. We felt like the, uh, you know, the whole idea of services in India was big, but the next wave is going to be product, and 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 we wanted to do that sitting in uh, in India. So we both basically decided to come back to India. When we came back to India, our larger thesis at that time was, which, which is true, which is that mobile um, mobile is very critical. Uh, you know, uh, iPhone had just released in 2007, so two, three years ago, it was unleashing a new economy, which people are, uh, were not familiar with. And most importantly, it became the primary internet device in a country like India, where there was not really that much internet penetration. So fundamental assumption was there's going to be a paradigm shift in the way content is being consumed. Web is not going to be the way the first time a person discovers reading content on uh, or news or anything else. They will start reading for the first time on mobile and mobile becomes a primary internet device. Now, if it, in 2023, it seems extremely obvious, but in 2009, 2010, it seemed like people were like, what are you talking about? I mean, we're just, we still trying to figure out how to build a website. Why, what, we're not really worried about our mobile strategy. So uh, I think what we did is our first product was our mobile content management system. It essentially enabled um, publishers, et cetera, or content donors to basically plug it into their CMS and have the ability to create mobile sites and mobile apps in a very, very seamless manner. So if you go back a decade back and the first vintage of mobile sites for any top Indian publishing sites, Hindu, Business Line, Deck and Herald, uh, some of the Times properties, et cetera, were all powered by Mobstack. And uh, in many, in, in some ways, I'm like, I, I pride myself that we kind of helped unleash some of the mobile revolution in India in, 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 in a very small way. But as as you would expect with our many entrepreneurial journeys, that was exciting to the lot of action, but not necessarily translating into money for several reasons. Publishing itself was bleeding, which I'm sure you relate to. There's not really that much money. Uh, they were all still trying to figure out their strategy. And the fact that, you know, the whole our old and entire genesis was that there's a lot of fragmentation, a lot of devices essentially had to be catered to. All that kind of, that fragmentation really died. Nokia died, Blackberry died. So there's just iOS and Android. So you don't really need any sophisticated solutions. So I think a couple of market uh, market movements which really prevented us from scaling the way we thought we will. And uh, yeah, so that, that technically go well. And I want to kind of, do a little bit of a deep dive on this part of the journey. Um, so it, what you built was something like a rendering engine, which would render the content in a way that's mobile friendly. That's correct. Okay. Uh, how does it work? Like, uh, I, I'm not a techie, so you'll have to dump it down for me, but. Sure. Uh, so it was basically uh, what you call a dynamic content adaptation platform. We actually, uh, you got patents on that too, but the way it essentially did is it, it, it plugs into the content management system and it, when you plug in, uh, uh, when you plug into the content in my CMS, it pulls content, uh, from the CMS and on the fly, it puts a page together, depending on the screen resolution. Uh, so if the page the request is coming from an iPhone, it puts the page together in that way. If you're putting a page together on, uh, uh, from a BlackBerry to put put the optimize it for a BlackBerry, et cetera, et cetera. And so it would get activated only when it detected that it's uh, mobile traffic. Correct. Or Correct. it was always activated. And, uh, it was no. It, it is only when it comes in. So when it is from that, it would redirect to the m dot whatever the Hindu dot com or uh, m dot. Okay, 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 okay. So and it the, the, the mobile side, right? Correct, okay. correct, correct. And then it redirected it will redirect it to that. Okay, okay, okay. Got it, got it. So the m dot times of India dot com like, was essentially so all, beacon stack. Yeah, if you, mob stack. Correct, correct. If you if you scroll down at the bottom, you would you would always see that powered by mob stack. It would say that. Yeah. Uh, but that's back in the day. And how were you pricing it? It was all priced basically I mean, 
some some of those challenges, right? We didn't really know how to price it. So we basically said it'll be based on number of page views and we tried multiple things. It's just like some flat monthly pricing. Like uh, we tried multiple different things, uh, uh, but uh, we didn't really have a we had we didn't really have a good, I would say, in retrospect, a very value based pricing. It was more like okay, it costs us X to serve, so maybe we Y is what or X plus five is what we should essentially charge, and that's kind of how we started pricing it. And um, did you need funds to build this? Uh, the, the, I mean, you you were not a programmer, right? But was uh, Ravi a programmer? Ravi. Or? Yes, he was. Okay. He was. Okay. A, okay. He's, a, he's a brilliant product mind, and he's basically the architect of the product. And yes, we did we did raise some angel funding. We put our own money uh, into the company. Uh, we raised some angel funding, but you know, ten years back, uh, the money was not as as easily available as it is right now. <laughs> So I think we raised them 30 lakhs and, you know, we ran the company for about two years. Then we raised about four or five crores from Axel and Mumbai Angels, et cetera, and Bloom, et cetera, and then continued pursuing that idea and did that, um, did that for about, you know, almost a decade where we ran, ran through multiple ideas, multiple products, didn't really see them scale, but we were very frugal. Uh, which is what really helped us, which is we kept our head down, kept trying ideas, started generating some basic amount of cash and some total we had raised a little over $2 million, uh, sorry, $3 million. And with that $3 million, we ran the company for about a decade. Wow. Uh, 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 well, when did your uh, product go live? Uh, 2009 you started, right? Uh, Correct. Two, so I think it's, there's two avatars, like 2009 to 2019 is when basically we ran Mobstack and that kind of when we, we, we kind of chanced upon what we call Beacon Stack right now, which is really scaled. Uh, but yes, 2009 to 2019 was Mobstack and we, 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 uh, we funded it. Go to market, etc. happened in nine itself or it took you a year or two before you started? I would, I would, I would say we took about 18 months, at, uh, sorry, about 12 months uh, to basically, uh, you know, get the product in place, etc. Then we start, we'll start hitting the large publishers. We started hitting the publishers. Once we started and you were leading sales. Yeah, Amazon. correct, correct, correct. It's all, it's all through friends and family. You basically reach out to where you can try to reach out to a very unstructured way. Um, start getting original sales, etc. Obviously, one of the thing learnings you also have right at the beginning is that um, that it is when you ask people do you like this product, everybody in usual original feedback will say, Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. But you know, if you don't ask, if you if you don't ask very specific questions about, you know, will you pay for it, how much will you actually pay for it? Which are things we we never asked. You realize the hard way that, you know, People might like it, but they might not necessarily pay for it or might not necessarily pay as much as you think it is. So those are all lessons that we learned very early on. And we realized that, you know, publishers were a, were a, were a bleeding lot. Like they were struggling. They were trying to, they were very highly disrupted by web itself. They were still figuring that out. So now thinking about mobile, et cetera, is a lot harder. And so the target industry that we were chasing was itself a pretty bad industry to pick it with. And that's kind of a larger realization more than anything else. Oh. So this uh, product of powering the mobile sites, uh, this was your primary product for the entire decade of uh, nine to 19 or, or like what, what other experiments did you run then? Um, I think, uh, I think we, we did that for about six years or so. Oh, six, seven years. And what was the peak revenue you were getting from that product? I think, uh, I think he basically, uh, I think we had a peak revenue of maybe a few crores, single digit crores. Yeah, annual, that's it. Um, uh, maybe four or five crores, I would say. Not, not really more than that. And that's kind of where we kind of plateaued. We didn't really, we were, we didn't really, kind of grow beyond that. Um, and we also realized it was very really hard. We were burning. I, I mean, 
it's also really important to understand that when you start building a SaaS product or a software as service product, there has to be a certain amount of productization in that, in the sense that if it was basically being what we realize is up the sun, apart from the industry that we're catering to, the challenge we also had is everybody needed some element of customization for it, which is not a bot product that can be really sold out of the box. And if that was the case, then you start drawing a line where, you know, this becomes like a literally, literally like a services. And when the services, then the cost of delivering that will gets even more expensive. And then it just doesn't best justify the amount of money that you're essentially getting paid. So those are all, you know, what, what I call learnings as you, as you kind of mature as an entrepreneur. And so we kind of moved out of publishing our, our yeah. our, then the question that we asked ourselves is basically, look, this mobile content consumption is happening. I mean, people are trying to do it in their own way. Clearly, it looks like there is, there is not, that, that trend is working fine, but it's not really something that we can generate a lot of revenue or people are able to generate a lot of revenue. So what is the next larger, uh, you know, trend that we are seeing that we can capitalize on? Both Ravi and I are very passionate about mobile and, you know, the fact that mobile can get very disrupt, uh, can be very disruptive. So what we essentially realized is that, you know, if you just take the, just the progress of how web worked and how mobile will evolve, people are consuming content and they were essentially consuming com commerce. And the next natural part we believe was how does the mobile engage with the physical world around you? That's really how it started. So... Uh, we said, okay, the mobile device has to play, will essentially becomes the center of your physical world. Right? It's not just a primary internet device, but it becomes the center of the physical world. If that is the case, then how does how do you basically help brands and businesses engage with the physical world around you with the consumer? That, that's kind of the problem statement we kind of defined. Started that down that path, and that's where we started with Bluetooth beacons, etc. Tried a bunch of different products. Uh, Again, then try tried using Wi-Fi as 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 another technology, because what we essentially said is in the, on the mobile device there are multiple technologies available: Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, geofencing, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and that uh, enabled you to be able to connect to the physical world. Which of these technologies will make sense? So we went down one technology after the other, and long story short, that's kind of how we eventually down the line we basically. Uh, came down with a product like Beacon Stack, which kind of started showing traction. And we kind of grew the product from there. What was the use case you were solving it for? So, I mean, you you have this broad uh, take that uh, mobile will be used more in the physical world as well. But was there a specific use case? What, what was the problem you were solving through the Bluetooth and the Wi-Fi? Uh, thingies which you were experimenting with like this. I think two three things one is we realized that brands love the brands love the idea of connecting the physical world and digital world there's a handoff that has to happen that handoff doesn't really happen right now uh, so this whole concept of omni-channel which everybody is kind of beaten beaten to death over the last 20 years the truth is it is not as omni-channel as they expected right there is a lot of challenges around it that's one. The second thing is, I think in terms of marketing spends also in the offline world or in the physical world, uh, when you spend money, you don't have clear ROI just like you have in the digital world, right? Because in the digital world, what happens is that you spend $100, so everybody knows you've driven this much traffic. In the physical world, you don't know. So is there a better way in which you can drive better attribution on those spends in the physical world? That's uh, the second reason. Um, and I think third, broadly speaking, I think this whole whole play around data, which I think was is and was very exciting even five years ago. The whole data is going to make a big difference. How do I help you collect data? Um, there's so much data collection that happens in, in the digital world, in the physical world, really, there is very limited understanding, et cetera. So can we enable using some of these technologies to help brands and businesses and by their extension consumers learn more about their preferences, et cetera. So, I think we are kind of kind of marrying all these things in, in a way and trying to figure out the right product market fit that can help us scale. And what, what's an example of this? Like, 
collecting data, the handoff from digital to physical, like uh, so I, a, an example of how it would actually help a brand. So I think, um, so I can give an example of how Beacon Stack works right now, right? Uh, Beacon Stack is, uh, helps with, uh, like right now we essentially use QR codes, but the truth is you can use any kind of technology to, to be able to trigger that. So for example, if you have uh, a, a Nestle water bottle and, and, and um, or a Starbucks coffee, whatever, and there's a QR code on that, and you take your mobile device and scan the QR code, and it will essentially open up depending on what they want to do. Either they'll say there's an offer here, or they'll say something about how 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 amazing this coffee is, not this water bottle is, or where this water, or this fact that it's plastic or recycled. It could be multiple things. Now, what really happens there is you won't know that this is a you won't know that this is a product that uh, this this device belongs to Akshay, but I know that this is a device that really has interacted with a Starbucks QR code or with a or to a or Nestle water bottle QR code. So when you open that page, you can essentially access, you can drop cookies, you can drop and 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 essentially retarget those those uh, same co uh, cookies using the same cookies online. So technically, if you want, you can see a Starbucks ad or a Nestle Nestle ad on Facebook or Google, etc. So that is that is basically how you kind of build what I call digital cohorts based on interactions in the physical world. So that's how you kind of pass the interaction and the and the transfer of you know what what you're doing in the real world is being transferred to a digital identity online. Okay, fascinating. Um. I'm assuming the uh, conversion rate would be pretty low, right? Like if there is 100 Starbucks cups which have QR code printed on it, maybe 5 or 10 people would actually go ahead and scan. Yeah, I mean, yes, yes. Uh, but broadly speaking, that's that's one of the, what do you call, one of the, uh, one of the use cases that I basically played. But I think, it all depends on essentially what the use case is. Uh, that's one. Two, also, I think with any advertising medium, that is usually the case. If you have a pretty large hoarding on the busiest road, there are only a few people who are, who are driving by or going to see it. It's not like everybody's going to see it. So I think there is a fraction, a fractional value attached to any uh, ad impression, etc. But it also depends on, you know, what the contextuality is and what you really trying to do there. Okay, so one use case is uh, you create a engagement layer on a, a physical experience and that gives you data which allows you to retarget that customer with more customized uh, advertisement. Uh, what are the other use cases? So I think if you look at, if you, if you look at uh, what we do at Beacon Stack, I think they can come into three broad strokes. One is driving engagement, like I just explained. The second is is around simply data collection in different ways. I mean, whatever your primary purpose is, you, you can drive data in, in different ways. The third and most, uh, the third part of bucket which is growing for us is, and which is where the total addressable market is very huge, is that in many ways, QR codes are replacing the physicality of paper, right? Wherever there is physical paper available, right? Menu cards are replaced by QR codes. Business cards are being replaced by QR code enabled digital business cards. Uh, documentation and marketing collateral is being replaced by QR codes. And uh, uh, vaccine certificates are being replaced by QR codes. So wherever you can, the physicality of paper being replaced by a QR code. And that 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 uh, is not only highly beneficial to brands and businesses because the, it makes it very seamless. It actually saves a tremendous amount of cost in in printing material, paper, etc. And third, and most importantly, it making the world uh, the world a little more environmentally sustainable because you're just saving a lot of trees. I think there is so those are the broad strokes. I think the power of what we're really trying to do is that QR codes are very pervasive in the sense that you know every day people are discovering new use cases even now. Every day we listen to calls, customer demos, and I'm fascinated by the use cases that people are coming up with, right? 
and uh, and those are all things that they are discovering themselves. And it's a little bit like email marketing, right? Email started as fundamentally started as a communication tool with peer to peer. Then you had very robust platforms like uh, Mailchimp and SendGrid essentially come along and democratize email marketing and convert that into a very powerful communication or engagement platform for businesses. That's exactly what we're doing. QR code was just a point thing where we enabled and captured information that could be shared. From there, now a platform like ours helps brands and businesses convert that into something very substantial. And, and we're doing that at, at scale and focused on large businesses. Okay. Okay. Um, give me an example of the second use case, uh, data collection. Um, data collection is, is, is two ways. One is personal identifiable information, uh, and the other is just cookie data, first party data, as it's called, which is, um, first party data is like what I already mentioned. You know, I drop a cookie every time you open essentially a page that retarget, et cetera. That's first party data. PIA is more like identifiable information. You basically scan a QR code on, on, on a box of cookies that you bought from some bespoke store that you really like and that person says, did you enjoy the cookies? Can this QR code and join our newsletter or do this and I'll drop another cookie, etc. You share an email address, you share your phone number or if you put a QR code in, a, in, in the US, a lot of open houses, real estate, they put a QR code outside and say, if you're interested in seeing this house, scan this QR code and fill this form, I'll reach contact you and do lead generation. So things like that, which basically any, which, which, it could happen physically in the past, would now happen digitally. Yeah, got it. Uh, okay, okay, interesting. And uh, what about uh, so replacement of paper? I understand, like replacing a menu card. Um, what is uh, what is the Beacon Stack platform do? Like, would it uh, host the ordering system also, or would it just create a QR code which directs people to a link? And uh, that's it. Uh, so I think a couple of different things. Uh, we are not focused only on restaurants. That's not a use case. We are a horizontal stack. So that means we have businesses of various sizes and shapes using this. We have industries across. We have SMB. We have real estate. We have financial services. We have CPG. We have pharma, yeah. hospital, etc. And as you can see, because it's a QR code marketing and engagement platform, we. This is what we call a digital customer engagement platform, physical to digital, right? And digital customer engagement platform sky's the limit in terms of use cases. And basically every industry vertical has some use case here, right? Um, so what we have essentially built is a robust platform, which does three things. One is basically it helps you create and generate QR codes and manage them at scale. If you have one QR code, that's one thing, but if you have a thousand QR codes, you have to be able to manage all these. The second thing is, this is not just about, is we also help you manage the end destination. So you want to, you know, you want to create a microsite, you want to create a form, you want to basically create a social media, whatever the end result might be, all that can be, we have a robust content management system. So you can essentially create that inside the CMS itself. So it's a very specific editor. So you don't need to be a developer to do it. You can, a marketer can essentially do it. A knobs guy can really do it without the need of actually a developer to do it. Um, so that's the second part. And the third part, I think, is just a lot of analytics on where the engagement is and what is really working, right? You put you put QR codes in three different places on a package in a, in a physical location and in some, some somewhere else. Uh, you will be able to capture information and see where are scans happening, what time of the day are they happening, is is there any merit in, you know, you will get a better sense for where where is the actual engagement happening versus right now the whole physical is one and that is completely one channel. You don't have better clarity and nuanced, nuanced understanding of, you know, what is working where. So the... Uh... Like the data about uh, when it's happening, et cetera, and that comes from like device analytics when uh, someone where the scan, the yeah. Code that, yeah, where the engagement happens, right? Where the scan happens, where the tap happens. Yes, that's kind of where we, yeah. we we basically decide that. And we capture a lot of analytics in the background. And because of these are all dynamic QR codes, even after the scan, QR code has been created and pasted on a bottle or on a package, 
even after that, depending on time of the day, day of the week, the, the QR code can keep pointing to different destinations. And that's, that's, that's what makes it very powerful. Okay. 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 So it's like a programmable QR code. Correct. Uh, it doesn't need to have a static link. It, it can, it, there can be a rule, rule based engine, which tells you where to direct. A absolutely. We do have a rule based engine. Right? Yeah. Okay. Amazing. Amazing. Okay. Okay. So uh, at a simplistic level, I guess it could have started, like say you have this URL shortening services. Uh, which take a long URL, shorten it so that you can print it easily and distribute it and people can visit it easily. That, that would have been, I'm guessing, like the first version of the product. Uh, Absolutely. Like Absolutely. In, in fact, uh, it's interesting that you say that because our largest competitor is a company that got acquired by Bitly. Uh, and, and that's exactly the same. And the way I explain that is, if you look at a URL or a, or a Bitly or a short URL, the short URL is basically the call to action in the digital world. And QR codes are essentially becoming the call to action in the physical world. So there's a good marriage there. And so what we are, what Beacon Stack, of, the goal is basically to become the call to action in the physical world. Our idea is to drive engagement from all the physical products and uh, places. I'm wondering, um, you know, when you did the, uh, the mobile rendering engine for uh, publishers, uh, you eventually discovered that no, uh, this was not a this was not a enough value adding for you to monetize it well. I guess today the native CMS platforms have that facility inbuilt. You don't need a separate facility. Um, could something similar happen here? For example, Google Forms uh, allows you to create a QR code to share the form instead of a bad. Thing. You know, all yeah. products. I mean, if it becomes, let's say, Mailchimp allows you to create a QR code with your landing page and so on. All these marketing uh, stack uh, products can build it as a native feature and thereby remove the need for a beacon stack to exist. I think so. I think, uh, I mean, you can never say that you'll be the most unique person in the market and there's nothing else. Uh, I've always learned the hard way that no competition usually means no market. Uh, so it's good to have healthy. <laughs> it's, that's that's a nice one. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 usually very healthy to have competition, and I think there is a, there is a need for uh, competing products to exist. I think, but we have a very unique proposition, and 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 I think what we're also seeing right now is that uh, the QR codes are very pervasive in the way that they're essentially being used. And our largest strategy right now is to basically see how we can use. Some of these use cases of productize them further and add a lot more value, which makes it irreplaceable. Uh, and what we are seeing right now is that there are specific uh, the industries that basically are using it is are, are across the spectrum, right? That's one. And the two, the thing is, even inside one specific industry, or in, sorry, inside one specific company, the use cases are are. are are humongous across marketing, across operations, across sales, across tech, uh, events, whatever. So instead of having each individual team essentially run their own QR code marketing services, most large companies are moving in the direction of we want one company to essentially streamline this and manage this at scale. And that's really how we think we will be, we'll continue to kind of drive and dominate this market because we essentially we kind of sort of you know managing and um, being becoming a central repository or the command con command center for all things QR, whether it's ops, whether it's uh, admin, whether it's marketing, whether it's sales or something else. So uh, why didn't the Bluetooth Wi-Fi experiments work? What, what made you realize QR is the way to do this? There's a lot of friction from a consumer adoption standpoint. I think the only one reason it fails is consumers don't like it. You can't push and shove and make them pay it. The beauty about software, selling software unlike consumer products, is that in, in, in consumer products, you can basically buy product market fit, right? You can just keep giving a lot of discounts and say, here is a new popcorn I've discovered, which has, is very tasty. Or you don't like it, okay, I'll give it to you free of cost, or I'll give it 10 rupees, you know, <laughs> and, and burn a lot of venture capital money and, and that click it like, uh, I could offer my software free of cost. Nobody's going to take it. Right? So who's going to take it just because I got it? So the beauty of software is there. You can't lie much, 
or uh, you can't fool yourself that too long eventually the reality will catch up with you so the point i'm essentially making for all is that there are multiple use cases and we kind of future keep yourself honest to those use cases you will be able to kind of build a pretty sustainable business and that's really what we do okay okay like how did the wifi and the bluetooth thing work like oh, they, sorry. there would be some uh yeah so what happened in bluetooth and wifi use case was that the tech, the friction to the techno the con- consumer adoption was very hard like bluetooth you have to turn on the bluetooth headset sorry you have to turn on the bluetooth on your phone there is this general consensus that it will drain your battery which maybe 10 year old 10 years ago the device it it, it really mattered now they go but the, that there is that overarching feeling that that's what will happen and for bluetooth and wifi they are what they call what are called pull technologies which means you need to actually have an app on your device to be able to engage these technologies as a brand as a as starbucks has to, if a starbucks has to engage you will need to have a starbucks app or a, or a app that starbucks is partnered with which enables you to basically do what needs to be done otherwise it will not work right uh whereas nfc and qr are what are called push which means you expect the consumer to take action based on if they have interest so there's no sense of spamming right if akshay wants to be able to tap or scan a qr code or tap an nfc tag to learn more about that specific product or location he will do it and that's really how uh it was very obvious after a few years of experimentation that that people don't really like that uh, that friction of having an app and driving text etc etc whereas if you make the spin, let the consumer decide if they want to tap and learn more then that's so be it and that's kind of what even the mobile device companies learn right that based on all these experiences uh if you just enable people to just randomly send notifications just because they walked by a store it's spam brands won't like it consumers won't like it and that's how the operating systems apple and android decided okay let's double down your codes and because they are the technologies which seems very seamless frictionless uh no cost because there's no new additional hardware hardware there's no spam uh you know and 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 you take enough data on everything and more that you have to ask for and that's the reason why what by some bluetooth could not do you are able to do yeah okay now, what was your go to market for this uh, who were your first customers and so first so, tell me that journey how you are going to begin stack yeah that yeah, for begin stack yeah so we have been a very inbound and seo led company that means we are very focused on looking at uh, search uh, search for uh, search results and looking at who is searching for what etc the reason for that is very simple the cost to customer acquisition is very very low in inbound so the first uh, we started this in 2019 and for the last four years we've kind of built this and uh, we till we raised only would be we raised cdc funding this in the beginning of this year but uh, despite that in the last four years we've basically been cash flow positive and we've been able to do that because customer acquisition costs are very low and the reason customer acquisition costs are very low is because we focused on inbound and product led growth as uh, very strong motions so what how do you make uh, product led growth work and just tell me like you know what what were your learnings from this which would help other founders to do replicate what you did here i think product led growth is basically again it might not necessarily work for every software stack that is really selling but to, i do think there is some version of what you're selling that might be if not the whole thing it is a version of it that might be worthwhile i think the intent of product led growth if you look at it, the philosophy fundamentally believes that in the past in last 30 years of software existing uh, software has been sold top down you send to the ceo you send to the cto you see send to the chief product officer that he or she will basically decide and this is makes sense i think when when open source developers started kind of building using and making a decision on what software has to be da- used it kind of moved the power back to the bottom of the pyramid right so product led growth is basically the philosophy that you can put a sliver of the product if not the whole robust product at least a small part of that product in the hands of uh, of uh, of of people who are maybe in entry level roles maybe in marketing maybe in operations maybe in engineering or maybe in 
where you tell them to get started with that product. And once you get started with that product, you can essentially continue to uh, utilize the product in a small way. And so that I paid a small amount of money so that eventually when it gets to, it bubbles up all the way up and then it becomes a much larger contract. Right, so it's a it's the reverse of how sales and software sales have been done in the. That's the philosophy of product led growth, and I think there there is there is strong merit in doing that. Obviously, there are cases in which it's not applicable depending on what you're selling, but I think in most cases, either as a as a go to market to kind of drive visibility, or eventually to drive sales itself, product led growth can work quite efficiently depending on what you sell. Okay, so how did you implement it? Like you would give certain number of QR codes for free. Correct. So there is uh, something uh, like what Mailchimp would have done. Like. Correct, correct. So we we we've, we've always been very strongly focused on uh, product led growth. We also have a very strong inbound both That is, we've always written high quality content around how does uh, whatever the topic might be on various perspectives that throw a lot of traffic to our site because they throw a lot of traffic to our site. We were able to say, do you want to try this 14-day trial on this product? And you can pay as low as $5 a month to all the way up to $99 a month. And that's that, that's really how they started uh, utilizing it. And because they started utilizing it, the uh, uh, customers basically, we started realizing that it's not just small and medium businesses that are using this, this small, small plans. Even small teams of individuals inside large companies are using these calls because they have tactical use cases. But those are use cases that you can essentially use to leverage to kind of move them up the value chain and make them pay more. And that's kind of the journey that you're on right now because you start with a small amount of money. That person is spending $500 a year with you. How do you get them to charge, charge, spend $5,000 a year with you? How do you spend, get that person to just spend Fifty thousand dollars with you. How do you make that person spend five hundred thousand dollars with you? That is a question of two things. One is actually building the depth of the product, where the value is uh, commensurate with five thousand, fifty thousand, five hundred thousand, and building mechanisms and instrumentation that allows people to be able to measure that value, and push them in that direction, all in a very automated fashion. We have fifty thousand paying customers. It's not like each person can be sent an email uh, or sorry, called and told them, like, look, you have crossed that. You have to instrument all that. You have to automate all that. And in this damage, everything can be automated. So that's 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 the PLG motion. Amazing, amazing. Okay. Like, like you would create milestones and nudges and people who cross a certain milestone would receive a nudge. And Absolutely. To try out some additional feature Absolutely. and so on and so forth. Absolutely. And and I think, I also think it's really important to see once you start operating at scale, what happens is you can start looking at cohorts. You know, you can say these are the people who are in CPG brand or, or as it's called FMCG in India, FMCG brands are, are doing, these are the five things that they're doing on average. So when you have a FMCG brand join you with, with one specific use case in mind, then essentially uh, you can tell them, hey, your peers are doing three other things or four other things. So helping them scale their use cases and as they scale their use cases, they will spend more money with us. Okay, okay, amazing. So I, I guess you, you would be somewhere in, in like uh, comparable to a MailChimp in terms of the, the way in which you're selling. Yes. Like a pure inbound product lead uh, and like a, product which appeals to both uh, a team of two people as well as a company which has, let's say, 20,000 people. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Uh, MailChimp, yeah, MailChimp is a very good example. Uh, I think MailChimp, so if you're in product-led growth motion, I think it would be either, I mean, there's all concept of, uh, there's a lot of literature on, on how to build product-led growth motions. And I think if you're a SaaS founder, uh, it, uh, if you're just getting started, it's worthwhile reading more about product like growth motion. Uh, I think there is there is there are different philosophies for how you let them try a product. There is free MIP, there is free trial, there is reverse trial, et cetera, et cetera. All these different things will allow allow you to do it. So MailChimp, for example, is free MIP. Whereas Beacon Stack is free trial. That means for 14 days you try the product and then you essentially 
in those 14 days, you have to make a decision whether you want to buy or not. That's made to allow freemium, which means there is a free forever kind of a plan which uh, you can sit on for any long amount of time you want. But eventually, when your demand or your need price increases, you will eventually start paying for uh, Mailchimp. What made you choose free trial over freemium? The beauty about that, mostly driven by cash. We were bootstrapped, we were, we, we were very frugal, we were running off for our own cash flows. And we had not raised any more funding, like I said, for 10 years, we were just doing this on top of our own cash flow. So we said we will not, we will take all the money up front. So we had only annual plans. And we basically said we will focus only on uh, on, on free trial instead of freemium, which will, which will push people in the direction of uh, this one. That's what. The second thing also, I think it, dep- it depends on how people are thinking about it. We are in early days of a new vertical. We are not not building a product for which a, exist, a vertical exists. So what I mean by that is CRM as a, as a software has existed for like 20 years right now. Many people are building different kinds of CRM, but I think everybody understands what a CRM is. So if you are building a CRM, I, I think there is merit in there is a certain level of clarity that that you have and how to build it. So to be a differentiator, you want to offer a freemium solution. In our case, what's happening is it's a new vertical. People are just getting started in understanding it. So there is a, and and there is a tendency for if you do not push them to start utilizing, uh, they will kind of. There is there, there's a tendency not to use the product, but when you start paying for the product, the probability that you will use it is much higher. So, however small the amount is, right? If I give you Netflix free of cost, I don't know how much you'll watch. Maybe it's bad analogy, but still uh, run with it. Okay. But if you're paying some amount of it, non-zero, the value in your eyes goes up significantly. So you will start fidgeting with it, trying to figure out what's the best I can extract out of it. So there was some of that philosophy that we had, we had implemented. Of course, it has its own downsides to it. I'm just highlighting the upside. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's worked quite well for us. That, that is such a counterintuitive philosophy that yeah. when you're creating a category, you need to uh, not go freemium, but you need to push people to pay so that they use it. Amazing. Okay. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned that uh, you did not understand value-based pricing when you were doing the first product of the uh, mobile rendering for publishers. How has your understanding of value-based pricing evolved? How do you do pricing now? I think it's still a learning curve. The reality is I'm still I'm still working hard hard to understand it. I think the important thing about pricing and packaging is that it's First, it's it's a it's a dynamic piece. What worked for you six years or six months ago might not necessarily work for you today. So you have to understand the nature of the market and what people want. The second thing I think it's really important to understand is basically the atomic unit or the lever on what people are pay, ready to pay you more for. Right? Everything there is for a for Every product, there is an atomic unit based on which you will pay more. Is that number of login, number of users, uh, amount of content, catalog, whatever, like go if you're playing with the Netflix example, right? And, and as that, that, with that, you understand that lever and that atomic unit, you will basically be able to start focusing on how to build your product and how to build our value to right? Um, so I think pricing is, is is definitely a science. To begin with, you might it might be a little bit of an art because you, especially if you're kind of building a new vertical because you are flying blind, you don't know how much value you're adding. But as you start adding more and more customers, it very can quickly become, can be distilled down into a value-based science. And that's really what we're doing right now, which is very close, paying very close attention to what people are using. And then trying to evaluate whether Every every few weeks, we go out, iterate and see, okay, if you move this feature from this plan to that plan, will this go down, will that go up? And it's a lot of A-B testing. And that, that gives you very clear indicators of what's working and what's not. What are uh, some of the other uh, 
like, you know, growth engineering you've done around, let's say, improving retention or uh, improving the LTV for the long-term value for uh, users who have signed up? I think a lot of our entire acquisition strategy has been inbound. And for us to do inbound, we essentially do is we, we listen to every call, we listen to every demo, we use our entire, it's not just our sales team that uses to listen to demo, you know, marketing team does, does. And when our marketing team listens, they, wait, they pay very close attention to the U words and the phrases that the, the prospective customers use to explain what their problem is. You take that content and then create content around it, right? And that essentially drives more and more traffic to us and more traffic means more people and more people means more content. And that's a positive reinforcing loop and that's worked extraordinarily well for us. Amazing, amazing. Okay. And what about things like retention rate and stuff like that? Like what kind of retention rate do you see and are you doing some? So our son is, our son is our lowest in in for any SaaS benchmark, I mean, it's like half a percent, which is outrageously low. And uh, there, are some, uh, there are several reasons for that. I think one of them is that we are a sticky product in general uh, because we, of what we do, it's very hard to kind of pull when you, when you replace, put QR codes and put stuck QR codes on packaging on locations, wherever the use case might be. There's a lot of interesting use case. The second thing is, like I said, it's an, it's an emerging market. Every day people come up with new use cases. There's a lot of experimentation that's being done. I think we are doing a pretty good job in explaining to customers on here are three things you have done and here are five more things you can do with it. So even though that person has originally come with one specific use case in mind that might or might not have worked, they're always excited in the prospect of working with those two or three or four or five use cases that we are teaching them. So there is this continuous work in progress which people are realizing it. It's very horizontal like you can imagine. Like as I talk, in your own head, you will think of, oh, maybe I can use your codes for this now. I've not thought of it, but this is how I can take out of it. And that's the power of what we do. Yeah, amazing. Uh, why are there sales calls happening when uh, you have like a free trial? And like, like, you know, is there a way in which you decide, okay, for certain type of businesses or customers, we will have a physical, like a physical as in a, a, a human sales effort and for others, it will be pure product led. So we have enterprise customers. So that means after self service, uh, uh, beyond $99, $1,000, we have enterprise plans, which are for our customer mid market and enterprise, uh, brand. So we essentially there and at those, uh, at that level, basically we have sales reps who basically call and talk to them. These are start at $10,000 to $100,000 ACVs. Right. They pay us. $10,000 to $100,000 uh, per, per year. So for those people, we essentially call uh, or they schedule demos, etc. And this also happens through some inbound, like there would first be some interest and then yeah, it's, 100%, uh, client. it's all 100% inbound. We don't have an output yet. It's something we have to build, but we don't have anything right now. Okay. Okay. Who's your uh, competition in this space? Like you mentioned, one of them was acquired by Bitly. I think that's the primary competitor. I mean, we have other small, 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 small competitions, but I think the only competitor we not competitor we have is Bitly. Okay. And how do you, um, how did you go global in terms of your sales? Uh, was this something specific you did or it's just that you were reliant on inbound and the inbound started coming from all over the world? And, and like right now, what's your split? Like how much of your revenue is from India? How much is from outside? India is negligible to non-existent. Uh, North of ninety percent comes from North America. As I've said in every interview I've taken, I've done a credit on a dollar than a rupee. It's easier to earn a dollar than a <laughs> not, not, not my quote, right. but uh, I've stolen that quote from someone else. I think I heard it somewhere, but that's the truth. Selling software in India is very hard. Uh, it's very very hard in India. People don't understand the value, and it's not worth it. Uh, America is, is obviously much bigger, larger, etc. Cetera, et cetera. For all the obvious reasons, I think it's much easier to sell there. Um, I think we also, Ravi and I have lived in the US. New York is like second home. So we've been very comfortable in the last year to in a sell in North America. 
But either way, if you are, and, and third and most important, I think, is that Americans, I think, because of the history of software, are, are early adopters. They are okay with the idea of experimenting and trying something new. You will not, uh, you will not get that in other parts of the world that easily. So if you're trying to do something for the first time, it's always helpful to reach and try to sell that in North America. Of course, there are some fantastic examples of SaaS companies being built out of India, focusing on the Indian market and Southeast Asian market, et cetera, et cetera. And kudos to them for doing what they're doing. But I personally think selling to North America is efficient and, and the ROI on that is a lot more powerful, a lot more efficient, uh, significant. When did you reach this conclusion? Because the previous version, Mobstack, was largely selling to Indian publishers, right? Correct. I think that's where I learned. Okay. So, okay. okay. You you tried selling to publishers abroad also, like in the US? Right? No, I think I think twofold. One is basically it also depends on product DNA. Uh, sorry, founder DNA. Uh, one is yes, this understanding this differentiation dif- differentiation between. Indian and US, uh, trying to send to Indian customers and US customers. I think over the last seven to eight years, I think since Freshworks went public, etc., there's obviously a, a strong understanding of transport of SaaS, and there's like a cottage industry of transport of SaaS companies emerging out of India. So there is enough literature and playbooks available which explains and how you build an Indian SaaS company focusing on North American markets. So that's one. The second thing I think is the fact that um, I think when I talked about founder DNA, if you're a very sales-led more, if you're a, I think my co-founder is a very strong product guy, and naturally I think product and marketing comes to me a lot more naturally than sales. And I, I think when you think about a product and marketing sales, uh, marketing-led motion, which is the PLG motion, it's it it is not. Na- then essentially you are saying the web is where I'm going to sell it. And when you say web is the way that you're going to sell it, it doesn't matter whether the customer is in India or in the United States. You're essentially selling it to someone who's browsing on the net. So when you start looking at it from that standpoint, it just seems like US is a much bigger advantage. Of course, if you are a if you're if your DNA is that of selling and you're a strong sales guy, you have the ability to kind of go pitch and make a sale in person to someone, then I can see why there is strong merits and advantages in selling to Indian uh, companies, etc. And why some comp- some people start selling in their Indian market uh, rather than the US market. Two is that you are built a product with all again no, with uh, with all due respect. I don't mean it in a derogatory way. If you are trying to build a product which for which already l- lots of similar players are there, you're just building a product which is cheaper and more com- more competitively priced than uh, an American product that already exists. There's a lot of competition in that side of the world for this. So I you as well take that product which might have similar similar amount of value but priced more competitively. Uh, you want to sell in India because Indians are very cost conscious individuals, so they will take a cheaper product and that's how the reason to sell in India versus the US. Okay, got it. Interesting. Tell me about uh, scaling uh, the organization. What's your headcount today, and what are some of the things you learned about building an organization? Oh, that's that's still a work in progress. We're a little over hundred people right now, uh, and uh, we have an office in uh, New York, and we have an office in Bangalore. Product marketing, engineering, etc. Well, India. I shuttle, uh, uh, sales, customer success, uh, finance strategy, all that sits out of uh, New York. And uh, yeah, I think I, I, I think it's hard to say that uh, what has worked and what has not. We're still in early days, but I think we thrive on good company culture. Like, and it's I don't want to give you some lip service as that you see your dozen how great our culture, how great our culture is. But if you if you if you if you look at Glassdoor reviews, you'll have a good idea why people enjoy working for us and why we are rated as we are rated there. Yeah, but what's the secret behind it? Why are you so highly rated on Glassdoor? 
related very highly on Glassdoor because we fundamentally believe in hiring very good people and getting out of the way. I basically say only two things when every employee joins. I say, I can assure you of two things here. That's the rest of it is up to you. One is you learn a lot. And two, you'll meet incredibly nice people. Uh, and those are things which are not negotiable for me. Right? Uh, and everything else is fine. So we, we, we are very high on skill versus will. Sorry, we're very high on will versus skill. We're very, fo- we're very focused on looking at intent rather than what you know. It's about where you want to go. But that, that, that drives trajectory and that drives our belief system. Uh, I also think that life was too short to be surrounded by smart asses. So uh, we don't hire people who we, who, who we think are, might be really good, but might be painful to, might be toxic to our culture. I also think, finally, if there is one secret sauce, I think we have a very empowered interviewing process. We have four people meeting every, at least four people meeting every new hire. Each, and those four people could be any designation, any level. We choose a team that hires them. And each of them have one vote. It doesn't matter who they are. So there are many times I've walked into an interview setting where I have voted for the person saying we should hire, but maybe a, someone who is much more, ju- more junior a junior might have said no, and then it's a no, the veto. Uh, that builds a very responsible culture. Everybody takes high, tremendous amount of responsibility that she has brought or he has brought in that particular individual, and they have voted for that person. Uh, they feel like they have a say in, in, in essentially increasing the size of the tribe. And that brings a certain thermo sense of commitment to the organization. If there's one thing that's worked for us in building a good, good culture, it's that I don't make top down decisions on we should hire this person, we should fire this person. It's all very collectively done. Well, what's your ARR like now? Uh, if you're at Liberty yeah. too. Yeah, we are a little over 10 million. Amazing. Amazing. So what's the, uh, like, you know, what do, what do the next couple of years look like, uh, both in terms of what you want to do on the product side, how you want to scale up your you know, customer acquisition? I think, um, I think we're continuing to grow despite the macro being pretty bad. I think our churn is very low, continue to grow. So I think there are a lot of positives in terms of how we grow, uh, how we've been growing. Uh, and I also think that we have a pretty healthy set of uh, customers, which which has been helping us. Uh, right now, I think uh, the, the core... The core focus is for us to kind of zone in our product strategy and kind of understand, you know, how we can add more value to, to a set of customers that we think will be very important. Uh, we are also sp- paying a lot of attention to the kinds of use cases that are emerging on the horizon. So I think the question, we, uh, the, the question that we have to ask ourselves is, you know, what are products that we will build versus product which will open up the platform where we'll enable anyone else to come build on top of us, right? Because the use cases are so broad and so interesting that the question that we have to be able to answer is what are things that we will be able to productize, how we will essentially be able to kind of, you know, build more depth on. And similarly, uh, as other people discover new ideas, can we kind of provide them the building blocks that will help them come and build their own QR enabled or QR empowered strategy? And that's kind of what I'm putting pieces of that together right now. So, like an app marketplace, so like say Salesforce has like an app Post marketplace. With... Correct. Correct. Okay. Correct. Okay. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Amazing. Amazing. Okay, so my last question to you, uh, what's your advice for young aspiring founders? Oh, young aspiring founders. It's what I say to anyone, which is, uh, there's, a, there's a Shakespeare quote, which says, what's past is prologue. It essentially means that whatever you've done so far is setting, you the, setting up a stage for what you're going to do in the future. So... Don't worry so much about 
don't, you know, uh, uh, don't give up so easily. Actually, that's that's the. It takes a while to get to get to get to where you are. Um, it it takes a significant amount of effort to discover what's right. Uh, and so be persistent. That's one, which is goes without saying. The second thing which I'll say, which I think any white or mitotic be, is that entrepreneurs are overrated. There is there is obviously a lot of blood, sweat, and tears, and I have tremendous respect to my other peers, and I've been that at this for a decade. So you cannot come, you cannot say I'm not persistent. I am persistent, but that's not just enough. Never underestimate the power of market and timing. People are extraordinarily successful. Are successful because they they time the market very well. And that's like hindsight is twenty twenty, right? You have to be at the right place at the right time. Never underestimate that. There are phenomenally talented founders. I'm sure you're doing a phenomenal job of doing what you're doing. You've still not seen breakout success because your timing is off. Either you're ahead of the market, you're behind the market, et cetera, et cetera. You just keep doing what you're doing. You know, if you're standing at the beach for long enough, eventually the wave will hit you. So it takes 10 years to look like you have been at the right place at the right time. So, so don't worry so much about it. Uh, just keep doing what you're doing.